Okay, good evening everybody. This is the November 1st, 2018 meeting of the Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'll be presiding tonight. These proceedings are being audio and video recorded. If you're watching at home, it's possible you have some interesting things happen, happening with your signal, but NCTV is working those out. We have a backup camera that's recording these for the record. Uh, we'll start with public comment. This is a three-minute um, opportunity for members of the public to speak on any issue you wish. Please remember that uh, we're forbidden by our rules from engaging in a back and forth with you. Um, I have three people signed up, and afterwards I'll open it up to anyone who hasn't had a chance to sign up. The first is Hattie Healy. Thank you. And Ms. Healy, if you give your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Patty Healy. I live at 21 Longfellow. I'm in Ward 6, Marianne's uh, ward. And uh, Marianne shared with me that the council received a letter from um, Dr. Lynn, who is the president of the American Medicines Association in Massachusetts, um, disputing uh, cost factors on question one. Um, and this isn't a surprise to you that they would send this, but um, the American Nurses Association of Massachusetts represents uh, well under 2,000. I think they won't release how many members they have, but it's got to be under 2,000. It's not staff nurses who work in hospitals. It's primarily um, directors of nursing, managers, uh, non-union, primarily almost all non-union. Um, people with nurses' licenses. And um, anyway, I'm not going to go through the detail of the letter at all because it kind of um, goes on about the, the cost of hiring nurses and the particular study that was used by um, the researchers at Boston College. What I did want to mention to you is that all of the Co Coalition to Protect Safety is um, a coalition that is 100% funded by the Massachusetts Hospital Association. And all of their, uh, I have about 30 different um, supporters, organizational supporters. None of them are unionized nurses. None of them are staff nurses. They're organizations that are run by management or um, directors of nursing in hospitals and are very wealthy, uh, profit-making hospital corporations in um, Massachusetts. And I just would like to remind people that this ballot initiative is a law that does exactly what the question one people have been talking about, which is to up staff in the hospital to make it safer. And the no uh, people, the no campaign is a multi-million dollar campaign run by the hospital industry. Every single interview, every TV show, every, um, uh, everything that I've done, I have been up against a director of nursing, never a nurse in every public setting, including uh, yeah, debates and so on. So I just wanted to remind you that um, the people who really are looking to have safety in the hospitals are those of us who are working staff nurses who take care of sick people in beds at the bedside. And that yeah. means also in our hospital, Cooley Dickinson Hospital. That's our hospital funded with our tax dollars. People, nurses from our community, and it's not, even though a hospital corporation runs our hospitals, we really should start believing that our hospitals belong to us. Hi, I'm Jessica LeFleur from 244 South Street. I'm asking the City Council to provide guidance and clarification of the requirements to be met in the special oh, permit process. Words were chosen and approved by the council that convey a recognition of the importance of maintaining the character of a neighborhood. I am proud of the motion to encourage infill took such care to maintain the visage of our city. But now I'm concerned that what was conveyed to voters regarding the maintenance of their neighborhood character will be sacrificed for proposed development projects. I cannot reconcile the terms infill with the project proposed for South Street. I am stand approval of the special permit does not lie within the city council's scope. I hope the council will stand behind what was conveyed to the public. In a Gazette article in May regarding infill on Lake Street and South Street, Lake Street and Florence, Wayne Clyden, the director of planning and development, acknowledged concerns expressed about what infill changes would allow to be built. The article goes on to read, to address those concerns, the city adopted design standards that govern massing and scale for non-single family homes in relationship to other properties in the neighborhood. It notes the property, the project should not be detrimental to the neighbors. 
The LLC has proposed the building of a new shaped apartment building with 35 bedrooms on a three-quarter acre lot, with a large portion of the green space within its fortress. It does not meet the design standards of any other non-single family home in the neighborhood in Massey and scale, nor in setback. When you drive down South Street, no one structure dominates that view. You know, the nursing home is set back. The bigger homes might be thin. If this is built, it will dominate the neighborhood. I trusted the words in the special apartment would help preserve the visage of my neighborhood. It was written into it with safety mechanisms to protect the harmonious relationship of structures. I walk, took a walk down South Street. The proposed development does not meet the standards of massing and scale of any of the 25 homes to my left or right. I was told by the planning board that those are guidelines. The words must matter use. But due to the add-ons regarding URBs, most of the provisions of the special permit process can be negated by the planning board. The question is, is that true? And did the city council understand that to be the case? Because the planning department sees the wording as guidelines, what can't be built? The precedent this project sets is alarming to many of us. This is supposed to be out of infill. There are currently 11 bedrooms between the two buildings. Does going from 11 to 35 bedrooms feel like infill or overfill? The neighborhood recently got behind an infill project of the old veterinarian building, <coughs> tear down the old addition in the back, and add five two-bedroom units. The question is, did we make a mistake? Now that project is being used to justify an even larger one. That project has 15 bedrooms. This project proposes more than double that. Will the next project in my neighborhood be double that? What sounded like a wonderful working relationship between the city and the neighborhood to create infill feels more like a battle to clarify the words we thought were put in place to protect the character of our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, if, if people, you know, bring things to the city council, it's not our intention to not respond to the sort of rules, and you're encouraged to follow up with your councilors um, outside of this session. Okay. Um, so next is Amy. Um, no, that's Rental self That's how I expect to. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Don't start. Yeah. I'm really nervous. Okay. So uh, I'm also here to express some concerns about what it's like to be a resident of Northampton, one who has no expertise in law or design, though I'm getting some, who's trying to understand and exercise the rights that are guaranteed to me by the laws of the city and the state when a project abuts my property and comes before the planning board. So my experience since July, when I first received notice of a, the proposed demolition of two buildings that abut my modest cape on Olive Street, formerly of Mrs. Deck, for those of you who remember Mrs. Deck, to be replaced with what the historical commission called in a hearing that we had no idea was happening, because apparently we don't get notified if something's being demolished, but that's not what I came to talk about. They called it a fortress-like structure. Um, my experience has ranged from confusing to frustrating to depressing. Um, having attended three meetings and having had dozens of conversations with Carol Mish and some of you and lots of other people who work for the city, here are some things that are unclear to me that I'm hoping that the, the city council can clarify. When can the planning board waive design standards and when can't they? When they can waive them, to what degree are they obligated to justify and explain the reason for the waivers to the public? Do or don't they have the right to waive criteria in the case of a special permit? I've had two conversations with Ellen Sewell, the city solicitor, who explained to me that the special permit is, doesn't get waived, though there's great latitude in how it's interpreted. But if you look back at the, here, the last planning board meeting, or if you want to read the transcript, which I have and I'm happy to share with you, you'll see that the instructions are not clear to the members of the planning board. The, the site plan and special permit stuff all got mushed together, and there were not clear directions given. So that's one set of questions. My second set of question is to what degree is the planning board either ethically or legally obligated to listen to the experts in the DPW? The plans that we are described on South Street have been uh, continued twice because they were either uh, incomplete or received pages and pages of notes from the DPW, Rich Parasoliti and um, Doug McDonald. Pages of notes to the degree they said it's very unusual. But there's no evidence from the hearing. They, both those men explained to me, these are just recommendations the planning board might not listen to us. Is that fair? Is that how it's supposed to work? Aren't they the experts and not some citizens who serve on the planning board with all due respect and to whom I'm quite grateful? 
So, so that's concerning to me. Um, I'm also going to say it's been a little difficult to get clear information from the planning board, not because I think anyone's intending to deceive, but because they have so much on their plate. So there's been three times I have been writing where Carolyn either answered a question or said something in a meeting. When I asked her to point it to me, she retracted and said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that's what it said, but it didn't. So I just want to say this experience has reminded me of when my husband was in the hospital. And I had to, because of the privilege I come as someone who's articulate and has some time, I had to stand by his side and fight for him. And I feel like that's what I have to do for my property now, and that's not fair. That's not how it should work. We should trust that the city is there to, to back us up. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for those comments. Would anyone else like to give uh, Eric? Uh, another, uh, um, uh, another quickie on uh, Arizona Ice Tea. Um, apparently, Elizabeth Warren's office needs to legislate it. We did some stuff with Wright Perg in Rhode Island. We're all familiar. I believe Coke and Sprite and every other company recycles. It seems we simply need to stamp it. There's some paperwork involved, so we can push that through. I'll Google them again. I go Google them once, and we got some speaking of rhetoric from Warren's office that the environment, keeping the environment clean, is as necessary as, as ever. I don't think cans really pollute the environment. Mother Nature can handle a little less, like me and young. And remember Pearl Harbor, the Arizona, so we'll keep pushing that through. Uh, Dylan's Liquors Recycle Stop and Shop did. My grandpa they had a trash compactor. We're all familiar. So we'll keep that on the agenda and push it through. It just seems to be, bam, a little lazy. Just put a stamp on it, five, cent, five cents for the state of Massachusetts. It's recyclable in, uh, in Hawaii and Maine, or Connecticut, not yet Mass. Arizona, I see it's a great drink. Uh, bueno, bebe, and it's a good package. So we'll just keep pushing that through. I'll, I'll Google her office again. Maybe Elizabeth Warren's office is good at dealing with sheetrock, too, because that's how the note sounded. I, I don't mean to be facetious. Rhetorical, R-H-E-T. O R C L C A L rhetorical, but we're all doing our best. So, from a college dropout, <laughs> I'll see. You. Thank, thank you. Kidding, sure. Go army. Um, would anyone else like to provide any comment? Okay. Hearing none, it sounds like we can convene. So I'll ask for a roll call. Council Chairman, Councilor Carney, Councilor Dwight, here. Councilor Klein, here. I believe you. That's what I wanted. I mean, Rappen, oh, nice. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor O'Donnell. Here. And Councillor Shea. Here. All right, we're all, as you heard, here. The first item of business is an announcement of a public hearing. Um, this is a petition from National Grid and Verizon New England, a uh, full petition for Dryads Green. Um, this is in accordance with provisions of Section 22, Chapter 166 of General Laws. A public hearing will be held on November 15th. 2018 here at 705 in the City Council Chambers, 212 Main Street. Um, on that petition to erect poles and wires upon, upon, under, or across one or more public ways. Um, for your reference, that's poll petition 2704-5389 for dry ice green. Next is an actual public hearing which we will be uh, holding. This is about the fiscal year 2019 tax levy. Um, a public hearing notice was published on October 18th and on October 25th, according to law. And tonight the City Council is holding a hearing to discuss the percentages of the local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property within the city, um, and according to Chapter 40, Section 56 of Mass General Laws. Um, so to start, I'd ask for a motion to open a hearing on this subject. Okay. Made and seconded. All in favor, open the hearing. Please say aye. 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 <coughs> so, hearing is now open, and I understand we have a presentation from the city. Someone in the city? I see two people who might be able to do it. <laughs> or, can we all end? Please, come this right and do it. Director. So um, this is the 2019 tax classification hearing, and Principal Assessor Joan Serafin and I have put this presentation together for you. It's, it's short, so don't panic. Um, so every year we have this um, about this time. This is um, sometimes referred to as setting the tax rate, but it's actually the tax classification here. So the first slide. 
Um, so when the Tax Classification Act was passed in 1978, it requires that um, communities classify property into four classes, residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property. Next slide. So the definitions of those um, I think are all pretty evident. Residential property is residential property. It includes single family homes. It also includes apartment buildings. Apartment buildings are not in the commercial sector. They're in the residential sector. Then there's commercial, there's industrial, and then personal property. That contains all the taxable property of individuals, partnerships, um, corporations. A lot of this is public utility, the, the infrastructure that they own. Next slide. So, Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 56 says that the City Council, together with the Mayor's approval in each city or town that has been certified as assessing at full and fair cash valuation, shall annually first determine the percentages of the local tax levy to be borne by each class of the real property. It says the City Council, together with the Mayor's approval, shall first adopt a residential factor. So that's what you're going to be doing tonight, is adopting what's called the residential factor. Um, and at the bottom it says, um, prior to the adoption of these percentages, you shall conduct a public hearing on the question of their adoption. So that is the purpose of our meeting tonight. So <coughs> next slide is just some historical information. Um, this is a uh, graphic that shows the City of Northampton's property values for the last 10 years. The green is residential, the yellow or the orangey color is commercial. The dark color is industrial, and then the smallest one, the yellow, is the personal property. So as you can see, the, the city's mix of residential and commercial has remained fairly steady, somewhere in the 80-20 breakdown. Okay, next slide. So each year, um, one of the things that gives us new revenue to put into our budget, into our operating budget, is new growth. And new growth is any tax revenue that we get from new construction in the city. And that could be brand new houses, that could be new businesses. It's also renovation. So if somebody puts a deck on their house or they add another bathroom or, or those kinds of things, all of that information is communicated from the building inspector to the assessors. They go out and check. And so it's a year-long process and they are certifying new growth. <coughs> and it's the activity that has happened from July 1 of last year to July 1 of 2018 is the new growth that we get in our 2019 budget. Next slide. So how, what makes up new growth? That is much more variable. Um, each year, there, as you know, there's different projects in the city of Northampton. Um, if you look, the green is residential, so you can see it kind of has gone up and down. The orange is commercial, and that has definitely varied over the years. The yellow is the personal property, and the darkest <coughs> color is the industrial. And I believe 2012, I think that was probably Cole Morgan, uh, or LE3, -E or whatever they're called, LEKO, um, that year. So the total value of new growth for 2019 the value of that growth was 54664375 So that's how much new growth there was in one year period in Northampton. Next slide. So how that translates to tax dollars for us, that $54.6 generates $931,000 in new tax revenue for the city. So you can see from this chart, this is a 10-year history of new growth. So the prior chart was the actual dollar value of the renovation or the new growth. This is the actual tax revenue that comes from that. So the up and down, the trajectory is exactly the same, but it just shows you some different information. And you can see that for the last five years, Northampton has been over $900,000 in new growth. So it's been pretty consistent. Um, and you can see that we are well ahead of where we were in 2010 when we had only 300,000 new growth. So all good for um, the economic picture for the city. Okay, the next slide. Um, major projects that contributed <coughs> to this 54.6 million in new growth was these are just some of the bigger projects. In 95 Barrett Street, 12 units of housing, ServiceNet's new office building up at Village Hill, 
the Lumberyard Project, uh, Riverside Drive, some um, industrial business space, and of course Atwood Drive, the office building that's down there. And again, even if these projects aren't finished, the assessors are able to pick up some of that value as of July 1st of 28, 2018. Um, they, the project doesn't have to be complete for them to start getting some new growth from that. Okay, the next slide shows you the two um, distributions, residential versus commercial, industrial, and personal property. And as you can see, Northampton has pretty much hovered around an 80-20 split for a pretty long time. Um, it's, you know, dips sometimes down to 79 for residential in 20. It's never really got to 21 for, um, it's like 79.8 to 20.2. So we're really at an 80-20 split um, on this. Next slide. For 2019, just so you can see in a pie chart how this breaks down, again, the green is residential, it's about 80%, and the other three categories are, are 20%. Okay, the next slide. So, the levy limit. The levy limit is, as you know, under the law, Proposition 2.5, we can only raise taxes by 2.5. We can only raise the levy by 2.5%. The levy limit for FY19 is 59,892,686. So that is the maximum that we can raise in property taxes. And how that number is derived, um, to, if you can see these numbers, in 2018 the levy limit was 56.7 million. We picked up $143 in amended new growth. We picked up 1.4. 1,418,963, that's the 2.5%. Then we added the new growth, which I just said was 931,482. So you come to a total of 59,108,954. So that is the 2019 levy limit. Then you add on top of that the debt exclusions. We have three debt exclusions that we're still paying on, the fire station, the high school, and the police station. So you add to that number the debt exclusions, which are shown over on the right side of the slide. The debt exclusions represent 23 cents on the tax rate. The fire station, the last debt service payment is this year, 2019. The high school, the last debt service payment is next year, 2020. So after next year, we only have one project on the um, tax rate that's, that's a debt exclusion, and that's the police station, and that will be on there till 2032, so it's going to be on there for a while. But the three debt exclusions in 2019 represent 23 cents on the tax rate. The total debt service payment is 783731 So if you go back to the right side of the slide, if you add that to the total, the total levy limit for the city for FY19 is 59,892,686. So that's how you get the levy limit. Okay, the next slide. So what we're here to talk about tonight is a single versus a split tax rate. This is what this whole hearing is about. So go back to the levy limit, that 59.8 million. Whether you split the tax rate or not, you can only raise 59 million dollars. You can't, splitting the tax rate doesn't give you more revenue. It just distributes that obligation in different ways. So if you choose a factor of one, that means that there'll be a single tax rate across the entire city, that all classes of property will pay the same tax rate. This is the recommendation of the principal assessor and the mayor. You have the option of doing a factor of less than one. What that does is it shifts the tax tax burden by reducing the tax on the residential properties and increasing the tax on commercial, industrial, and personal property. You also, and not too many towns ever do this, but a few, um, you can do a factor greater than one. And what that does is it shifts the tax burden to the residents and lowers it for commercial, industrial, and personal property. Not too many towns do that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. A single tax rate in Northampton <coughs> is what the mayor is recommending. The factor of one <coughs> will result in a tax rate of $17.37 per thousand for all property classifications, which is an increase of 33 cents or 1.94% for 2019. So that's pretty good. 
Um, for comparison purposes, uh, I've used the 2018 for some neighboring towns just to show you where our tax rate uh, compares. Not all the towns, everyone's setting their tax rates right now, so I don't have 2019 data. But in 2018, you can see Northampton's tax rate compared with Longmeadow, Greenfield, Amherst, Westfield, Holyoke, Chicopee, West Springfield, Agawam, and East Hampton. So you can see for a residential tax rate for the area, we're fairly low. And then over on the other side is commercial tax rate. Now, Holyoke, Westfield, Chicopee, West Springfield, and Agawam all have split tax rates. So you can see the difference in their tax rates. Um, for, Hol for Holyoke, their residential tax rate is 1913, but their industrial tax rate is 39.69 per thousand. So, uh, and then the other towns on that chart for commercial rate do not have a split tax rate, Longmeadow, Greenfield, Amherst, Northampton, East Hampton. But it's important to note, because if a business is looking at a place to locate, they're going to look at the commercial tax rates. And you can see, again, that Northampton is on the, on the low side. Um, for the comparative communities. Okay, the next slide. So if you were to choose to split the tax rate, you have a limit on how much you can actually shift. It's called the minimum residential factor, which is 87.79. So instead of 1.0, you drop it to 89, you could drop it as low as 87.79. You can always pick a number in between, but that's the maximum that you could shift if you wanted to shift it away from the residential and put more of the tax burden on commercial. If you did that, if you did the maximum shift, the average single family home in Northampton is valued at 310,000. <coughs> so at 1737, which is the rate that if you choose a single rate that it would be, that average home would pay 5,399 in taxes. If you were to do a split rate and do the maximum, that average home would actually pay 4740 So their taxes would go down $659. Conversely, though, commercial and industrial would go up. And on the other side, you can see the tax rate for commercial. So residential would go down to 1525 Commercial would go up to 2606 and if you look at that, uh, the average commercial in Northampton is valued at 571000 Their tax bill would increase by 4966 And the average industrial property is 645000 and their tax bill would increase by 5600 So you can see it's a very big <coughs> swing. The residential goes down a small amount, but the commercial and industrial go way up. Okay, the next slide. Single versus a split tax rate. So in Massachusetts, 236 communities, or basically 67% of the communities in the state, have a single tax rate. 110 Massachusetts communities had a split tax rate, and they range from three cents more than the residential rate to $21.47 above the residential rate. North Adams actually has the highest. It's 39.85 above the residential rate. Five Massachusetts communities did the other thing, which is actually shift the um, tax burden onto the residences and away from commercial industrial. There's only five of those. Usually a community might even start talking about a split tax rate when their mix of residential and commercial industrial is, is in the range of 70 to 30. We're at 80-20. So most communities, if they're going to shift it, are going to fall into the 70-30. They have a higher commercial and industrial tax base. The other thing is they look at their major tax paying businesses. And are they businesses that one can't move? They're a power plant. They're a shopping mall. Because when you do this, you always risk the chance that a business may say they're going elsewhere. So communities that do a split rate are typically ones that kind of have that large business hostage. Um, so it can be difficult, too, after you've split the tax rate to revert back, because it's always such a big swing that it results in a fairly large increase on residential customers if you try to start to swing that back. And some communities that did do this have been slowly and very incrementally working their way back. A few years ago, Longmeadow split their tax rate, and they abandoned it and went back to a single tax rate. So. So anyways, go, go back to the mayor and the principal assessor are recommending a factor of one, a single tax rate. And 
next slide. There are two other options that can be done, but they can only be done if the mayor recommends them. The mayor is not recommending them, but they are a residential <coughs> exemption, which allows you to shift the tax burden within the residential class from lower valued properties to higher valued properties. This is, does also shift the burden to rental properties, which is one of the, the bad effects of this. Um, communities that use this are typically communities that have large vacation home populations, the Cape. Um, small, the other one is the small commercial exemption. That allows smaller businesses with an employment of no more than 10 people and an assessed value of less than a million to receive an exemption. But adoption of this exemption increases the commercial and industrial tax rates. The amount of the tax levy paid by those two classes remains the same, but because of its exempted valuation, it's distributed over a different uh, assessed value. So the higher rate creates a shift that reduces taxes on owners of properties occupied by small businesses and shifts them to larger commercial and industrial taxpayers. The problem is this doesn't benefit many of the small businesses, particularly here in Northampton, that may not own the property that they actually use for their business. So they're going to feel the impact because they're going to get the tax increase. It's not really going to help them. And then the last side. So the summary is the principal and assessor and a mayor are recommending to city council that we approve a residential factor of one for 2019, which results in a single tax rate of $17.37, which is a 1.9% increase. And Joan is here. So if you have any specific questions for the assessors, I don't know, do you, do you, want, you want to come up? Sure, would you, would you like to provide any comments, Joan? You're certainly no, welcome think, to. Uh, Susan's done a wonderful job with this, and everything's pretty much explained. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to okay. Well, try to help. thank you both for putting together a very clear and, and informative uh, presentation. It's very helpful. Um, so I'll open up to, well, I guess first before I open up to the council, I'll ask if there's anyone, this is a public hearing, is anyone in the public who'd like to speak for or against um, or on this issue? Okay. Uh, members of the council, anyone like to opine or ask questions on, on this? We do this every year. Councilor Dwight, don't mention Holyoke. I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, do, we do have this conversation every year. And in fact, I am going to mention Holyoke insofar as that I'll allow it. That's fine. Holyoke is strapped with the problem, the dilemma that you described, essentially. And most of the communities that you see that have, have a split tax rate are mm -hmm. former industrial powerhouses who are pretty confident that their industries were going to remain mm -hmm. and subsidize all the the carry the bulk of the burden for mm -hmm. taxes and then as Holyoke experience and mostly industrial uh, experience in this part of the country there was a tax flight all those large industries moved down south and then eventually overseas mm -hmm. But consequently, they are trapped now because they, there is no easy transition to, uh, to redisperse and, and, and accommodate the, the, the huge deficit they have. Hoyoke, I, I thought Hoyoke used to have the highest oh, yeah. commercial tax rate. Um, I yeah. guess now North Adams is. North Adams does, them. does, yeah. Beat them out. You beat them out. But North Adams also has a significant investment by the state and others in the uh, Mass Mocha and some other programs. Right. Hoyoke has not had that benefit to date. The fact is, is that Northampton was not a large industrial town. It, um, it, it, it never made sense to actually have a split tax rate in order to accommodate, um, uh, you know, to benefit from a large industry that was going to be permanently here. The only one permanent large industry we have here is non-taxable. Wouldn't that be Smith College? So, so, um, and each year we do have this conversation that we've also speculated, I know, in years past about possibly readjusting the, the factor of one and also... Um, the discussion that someone one, one year brought up the within the ca uh, classification of residential making the adjustment, but you're right. That was designed for second home community <laughs> places such as the Berkshires and Cape Cod where massive homes uh, uh, distorted the property values for the, uh, for the community and created a burden for people who had lesser valued homes. And those homes were vacant three quarters of the year. 
and and so basically you had a number of people who were working as the landscapers for these properties and that's about it and there was no resources available to them and it makes sense in that case it's not the circumstances here so i i <laughs> sorry i brought a play again but you know you go with what you know and and and, and hoyoke has been burdened with this struggle for a long time and I and we each year we've approved uh, the factor of one for the reasons that actually have been clearly presented to uh, to us here. To uh, again, I I, um, I share uh, the council president's admiration of of the clear presentation. I really I'm very grateful for this. Well, the um, Western Mass communities that have the split tax rate, Roe is one of them. Right. <laughs> Nuclear plant, that's right. not really going to move. Irving, they have the Northfield Mountain. Um, you know, so a lot of these are in places where there's either a large utility that can't move or... Well, Roe, the nuclear plant did move, so now it's just a decommissioned plant right, that's right. not employing they, anybody but except for a few security guards. Right. But they still have to pay taxes. They still have to pay <laughs> taxes, that's right. Uh, Chickabee was west over, uh, yeah. yeah, in Agawam with Six Flags. So these are right. things that the, but as we know, we can't rely on that sense of permanence. I think everyone's learned a hard right. lesson in that respect. Right. And I think our new growth shows that businesses are attracted here. That chunk of new growth in commercial and industrial is is, is good. It's healthy for, and that's what's, you know, keeping our you know, our budget, as, in, in the position it's been Sorry. in. So. Councilor Barge and Councilor Klein. Yes. Um, Susan, I want to thank you very much for the presentation and also Joan Serafin. Excellent job. I think the single tax rate is, is the right way to go because if we look at King Street, we still have property there of empty land. Mm -hmm. And I think if we split right now, this would not be healthy for the city of Northampton for commercial. So I agree with what you're saying and what the mayor is saying of doing the factor one. Um, I also want to say thank you. It's a really um, helpful presentation. And I just wanted to check, you have a um, slide, about four slides from the end, before the end, about the impact, residential impact and commercial industrial impact. Yep. Um, so you give us the average um, values of, uh, commercial and industrial and residential, but I'm wondering if in the future we could also get the mean. Oh, sure. Because I think that that would really help to kind of understand um, how much, um, what the burden is for those, right. those uh, particular classification right. because we know there's some very large commercial and some very large industrial so right. that, I was that just number. thinking about it in terms of yeah you know, the, the, yeah um, we can do vacation that vacation homes on the Cape <laughs> it's kind of a right. similar question for me right. in terms of you know what what is the actual mean industrial size okay. and that would be helpful to to figure this out thank you Councilor Murphy mm -hmm. Well, the other thing I want to remind people about relative to commercial side is when you deal with downtown or Main Street um, if you split, you raise the taxes on the building owner, but they're all triple net leases, so the tax increase flows through to the tenant. So you raise the taxes on the business owner, but the person, you know, selling the jelly beans or the posters or the ice cream or the whatever is the one that actually gets the tax bill because it flows right. through to the tenant. Um, and, and that can be very, very difficult on those small businesses that are not even property owners. They end up, they end up getting hurt by that. And uh, given the distribution of our businesses, there are a lot of small businesses, and they do have the option to pack it up and head out of town. So I, th I think it's very wise to uh, to stay with a factor of one uh, in, in Northampton. It makes us very attractive, and the new growth proves that. We've had decent new growth. <coughs> Anyone else from the council? No? Uh, any final call for the public, if anyone wants to speak on this? If not, um, I thank both the uh, finance director and our assessor again. I'd ask for a motion we'll to, to close. close. Second. Made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor of closing the hearing say aye. 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 Same sentence. The hearing is closed. And we will get to that order um, after finance looks at it later. So thank you. Uh, I have no updates. Does any, any member of the council have an update to share? One minute announcement. No? Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, do you have anything? 
Thank you. Late breaking proclamation. Um, this is actually a proclamation that was requested by Forbes Library. Um, and uh, they, as you know, are, um, are home to the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Library and Museum. And they wanted to note publicly and wanted me to proclaim publicly that um, Monday will actually be the 100th anniversary of the governorship of Calvin Coolidge. Um, and uh, so I have a proclamation. Um, and I want to thank uh, the folks at Forbes for helping us develop this 100th anniversary of the governorship of Calvin Coolidge, whereas Calvin Coolidge served as city solicitor city councilor and mayor of the city of Northampton, <coughs> state representative, state senator, lieutenant governor and governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and vice president and president of the United States. And whereas Calvin Coolidge was a resident of Northampton from 1895 to 1933, and whereas Calvin Coolidge worked with Joseph Harrison, librarian at Forbes Library, to share his papers and memorabilia of public service with the citizens of Northampton in what is now known as the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Library and Museum. And whereas Calvin Coolidge served two terms as mayor of the city of Northampton from January 1910 to December 1911, and his mayoral service marked an upward climb to office and continuous public service until his presidential retirement in March of 1929. And whereas Calvin Coolidge was elected as the 48th governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on November 5th, 1918, to serve beginning uh, January 2nd, 1919, and then was reelected on November 4th, 1919, to serve until January 6th, 1921. And so now, therefore, I, Mayor David Jane Arkwitz, declare November 5th, 2018, as a day to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the election of Northampton resident Calvin Coolidge as governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the city of Northampton. So uh, this was sort of the only public op opportunity to proclaim this uh, uh, before Monday, but uh, Monday is that anniversary, and then obviously Tuesday we all go to the polls to vote for governor uh, in real time. So that's all. Great. We appreciate that. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, resolutions. The second reading on 18186, a resolution reaffirming Northampton and Massachusetts non discrimination law prohibiting discrimination in public places of public combination on the basis of gender identity and gender expression. There's a motion to second, second reading. Move second it. Made and seconded. Any discussion on second reading? Councillor Scherer. Um, I'll just note that since this passed in first reading, we've had many really horrible examples of continued bigotry and hatred in the news. And so it just makes this kind of stand against that kind of discrimination even more important. And it's, I'm glad that we're doing this today. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Anyone else have comments on second reading? Okay, this is read uh, at the last council meeting, so we won't read it again. I have a motion on the floor. I'd ask for a roll call vote on this. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 The resolution is approved in second reading. Uh, we have a resolution on first reading. This is 18197. Uh, which I will read into the record, and then we have a motion uh, to discuss it. This is in the City Council, November 1st, 2018. Upon the recommendation of Councillor Dennis Bidwell, Councillor Gina Louise Shera, and Councillor Jim Nash, a resolution opposing a renewed application for expansion of the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School. Whereas the Hadley-based Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School failed in February 2016 to obtain a charter amendment from the Massachusetts uh, Board of Elementary and Secondary education that would have permitted it to increase its maximum enrollment. And whereas uh, the school reapplied for such an expansion of enrollment in 2017 and was again turned down um, by MBESE. I'm going to be reading a lot of acronyms in this. Um, and whereas, um, I'm going to say, the school has gone back to the board a third time seeking authorization to expand its maximum enrollment, this time a 63% expansion from 584 to 952 K through 12 students. And whereas the Northampton School Committee is expected to reaffirm its opposition to the expansion of the school at its November 5th, 2018 meeting. 
And whereas the Northampton City Council in September 2016 voted unanimously to approve a resolution, uh, quote, opposing lifting the cap on tr uh, Commonwealth charter schools, end quote, with a major factor in that decision being the millions of dollars being diverted annually from Northampton Public Schools to nearby Commonwealth charter schools enrolling Northampton students. And whereas in fiscal year 2018, uh, 2019, uh, it is projected that almost $2.7 million net of reimbursements is being diverted from the Northampton Public Schools to eight nearby Commonwealth charter schools, enrolling 198 students from Northampton. And whereas in that fiscal year, 51 Northampton students are attending the school, accounting for over $690,000 of the funds diverted from Northampton's public schools to charter schools. And whereas the impact on the budget of the Northampton Public Schools of charter school funding is substantial, representing almost 5% of the system's operating budget, funds that could otherwise be spent on priorities such as preschool expansion, instrumental music in the elementary schools, and increasing staff salaries. And whereas the flawed funding program for reimbursing school districts for their payments to charter, uh, to, looks like a Scribner's error, to charter remains unchanged and is underfunded, meaning that any time a new charter school seat in the region is taken by a Northampton student, even more dollars will be drained from the budget of the Northampton public schools. And whereas only 5.9% of students attending the school during the 2017 through 2018 school year were students with disabilities, compared to Northampton Public Schools with 21.4% and a statewide average of 17.7%, indicating a persistent pattern at the school <coughs> of failure to provide equal access to students with disabilities. And whereas only 16% of students attending the school during the 2017 through 2018 school year were economically disadvantaged, compared to Northampton Public Schools with 26.2% and a statewide average of 32%, indicating a persistent pattern at the school of underserving economically disadvantaged students in the communities it serves. And whereas the school is even further away from meeting its enrollment targets for the above mentioned subgroups than it was two years ago when its expansion request was denied due in part to concerns about its ability to recruit and retain a student population reflective of the community it serves. And whereas the inequities of the charter school funding system create unnecessary tension and disunity in communions, uh, communities across the Commonwealth, often along social and economic lines, while pitting communities against each other in the struggle for dwindling state education dollars and pitting parents against each other around their often difficult and very personal educational decisions. And whereas the voters of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in November of 2016 voted 62 to 38 percent to oppose a ballot measure that would have lifted the cap on Commonwealth charter schools, which would have paved the way for creation of new charter schools. And whereas the voters of Northampton voted 72 to 28 percent to oppose that ballot measure, with all of Hampshire County voting 74 to 26 percent to oppose the lifting of the charter school cap. And whereas a broad range of organizations, including the New England chapter of the NAACP, Jobs with Justice, Massachusetts AFL-CIO, Citizens for Public Schools, Massachusetts Teachers Association, American Federation of Teachers, Massachusetts, and Northampton Save Our Schools, are all in opposition to expanding the number of charter schools seats in the Commonwealth. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Northampton City Council joins with the Northampton School Committee and Mayor David Narkowitz in calling on the Commonwealth's Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to reject the proposed expansion of enrollment at the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School. And be it further resolved that the City Council President is author uh, authorized to submit a letter to the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education and to speak with the board chair expressing this body's strong opposition to the expansion of the school as well as this body's opposition to the addition of any new charter school seats until the charter school funding formula is fundamentally reformed. And be it further resolved that Northampton's representatives in the state legislature are encouraged to redouble their efforts 
to achieve fundamental reforms leading to more equitable and expanded funding of the Commonwealth's charter schools. Do I hear a motion to approve? Make a motion. Second. Second. It's made and seconded. So <coughs> open to anyone, but we defer to the sponsors, perhaps. <coughs> it's Council Chair. Um, well, we just discussed the tax rate, so it must be time to oppose the expansion of the Pioneer Valley Charter, I mean, Chinese Immersion Charter School. Um, this feels very rote. In fact, it might be such a habit for us that um, I noticed that we actually forgot our last year's resolution in this one. So um, just if, if only to emphasize our, that our opposition is as dogged as um, the applications for expansion, um, I would like to ask that we add in the fifth whereas or create a sixth or put it under that and make it the sixth that we, um, we mentioned our, the resolution that the three of us sponsored last time, which we left out of this one, which was the uh, 17.406, a resolution opposing expansion of the Pine, uh, Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School. Um, so, uh, so if we wanted to add that to the fifth, we could just say, and um, the, in October 2017 uh, voted, and I believe it was unanimous, but we could check that for, um, voted unanimously to approve a resolution with uh, with that title. Okay, so I hear that as an amendment. Oh, I'll second the amendment. Second. Any discussion on the amendment, which adds that resolution to the fifth, whereas? Good no, addition. It, 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 well. The council is good to, good to point that out. I had not expected this resolution to be criticized for having too few <laughs> too whereas clauses. <laughs> I had said it was long before, but, but I realized but we. Ab absolutely, <laughs> it makes sense for the, for, for the record to, to, to include that. Excellent. So, ready to vote in the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that amendment is adopted. So back to the order. Councilor Sherry, you still have the floor? Um, that's all I have for now. Okay. Councilor Bidwell. Um, well, I, I thank Councilor Shera and Councilor Nash for their contributions to this. And I also want to point out that school committee members uh, Rebecca Buzanski and Laura Fallon uh, have been very active in this and consulted on, on, on this resolution, as did the Superintendent John Provost. Um, it shouldn't even be necessary that we have to do this again, but because the uh, proponents, the, the staff and the board of the, of, the, of the charter school are so persistent, they haven't gotten the message the last two times that the state board does not want to see this charter school expanded. But since they're persistent, we have to be too. And we know from the last two times that this has come to the state board that when, when the state board actually overruled the recommendation for expansion that came from the staff and from the commissioner, that the board does listen to the uh, viewpoints of the elected officials in the surrounding towns. So it is important that we yet again go on record with this. And as we've noted in previous year's discussions of this matter, this is not uh, about the pros and cons of charter schools. That's another debate for another day. That's not what this is about. This is about the funding mechanism that that is so continuously flawed and underfunded that, as noted, uh, $2.7 million of, of our city's tax dollars are drained to support charter schools. And, and the Chinese Immersion Charter School alone is uh, almost $700,000 of that, of, that, of that drain. So for me, it's unimaginable that we would do anything other than oppose uh, an expansion of a school that would represent um, you know, further hemorrhaging of our, of our tax dollars to, to support uh, uh, other schools. So I do think it's important that we again send the message. One last thing. We did call out in this resolution the, the very poor performance of, of, this, of the Pioneer Valley Charter Immersion Charter School in um, serving special needs kids and economically disadvantaged kids, and that's mainly because the, the school had the audacity in its application to the state to say things like that they are a proven to be an engine of integration in, in, in Hampshire County, the, the, despite the, the data that shows how, how much they underperform uh, needy populations. And they talk about there needs to be uh, additional opportunity to serve students who want to attend desegregated and integrated public schools. And it's, it's almost, you know, that, that kind of language 
which is so uh, at odds with the, with the facts on the ground is almost it's almost Trumpian. It, it's it's so distorted. So we, we felt we we did want to call them call them out on on uh, on on their on their claims. So that's all I have to say. Great, thank you. Anyone else, Councillor Clay? We just have a really quick question for the um, the sponsors. Do you not want to include where this needs to be sent? Is it not going to anybody at the very end? To the sponsors, anyone respond? Well, I know last year we went out of our way to, to, to um, authorize our, our, our council president to, to actually send a letter and potentially speak. We, the, the feedback we'd gotten was that that kind of communication is, is particularly effective. Um, uh, you're, you're right, Councillor, to point out that in addition to encouraging that personal contact on behalf of the council, we should do the, the, the normal uh, sending it directly to the, to, the, to the board and to the commissioner. And so so I, would, uh, I would gladly add that back in so that it's there in second reading. So do you want to say when the letter is sent, which I'm more than happy to do that expeditiously after the passage of uh, if this resolution passes, although we've noted we've done it twice before and it's passed unanimously. Do you want to just say that the letter will be sent along with the resolution? Along with so the resolution. So that we don't yes. spam them? Okay. Yes. So I hear that as an amendment. I'll second that. Seconded. Um, I think the wording we're using is in the uh, second to last paragraph, this council president authorized to submit a letter along with the copy along of this resolution. resolution. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Any aye. opposed, same sentence. So there we go. Um, any, that was a good addition, I think. Any other discussion? Councilor Nash. Yes, hello. Um, so, hello. <laughs> as a charter school parent, um, and um, that I'm, I'm honored to be part of this resolution with my colleagues, uh, Councillors Bidwell and Councillor Shara, um, that I, you know, I want to reread this one, whereas uh, because it, it's really important to me as a charter school parent, and and I, th I think it resonates with charter school parents everywhere. Whereas the inequities of the charter school funding system create unnecessary tension and disunity in communities across the Commonwealth, often along social and economic lines while pitting communities against each other in the struggle for dwindling state education dollars and pitting parents against each other around their often difficult and very personal education decisions. Um, that, you know, in, in my view, the, the, this, the law, the funding formula for the charter schools is meant to create this division. It wants us to not come together and be able to work together as a community as, as we are in Northampton, but also it, regionally, that, the, that these issues are, are you know, uh, that we're pitting, that, that our, we fill seats in our school in, in Northampton with children from other school systems so that we can make our ends meet. And that, um, that this is inherently a very unfair law, and that, um, and I think that it's it's right for uh, us to call this out, and that it it's underlying, you know, my opposition to this expansion. That until this inequity is is addressed, that um, that the and as we. Um, you know, voted for last year resoundingly that we need to cap charter school expansion until we actually figure this thing out. And um, so um, as a charter school parent, I am um, proud to uh, be part of this resolution. And um, thank you for listening. Councilor Murphy. And I want to echo both Councilor Bidwell and Councilor Nash. I don't want people to think that this body isn't sympathetic 
to parents who want options. I think we're sympathetic to parents that want options, but the way the law is written, mm -hmm. you know, we wind up being both a victim and a predator. You know, we lose students to charters and we lose dollars to charters, and then we have to prey on our neighbors to try and get those dollars back again. It's an insidious law that that just doesn't work. And and so we're put in a position where we have to say, hey, we have to oppose the expansion of a charter school because it comes out of our hide and it limits our ability to service the children in our schools um, and pits us against our neighbors looking to try and retrieve those dollars. It just doesn't work. <coughs> and you know, hence we find ourselves having to do this and would encourage, we got some new people going into state government, perhaps they will have the energy to try and change this so we don't find ourselves in this position next year. Any other comment? Councillor LaBarge. Yes, I'm, I'm going to support this resolution. And I have to echo with what Councillor Jim Nash was talking about. It does create a lot of tension. I have several residents in Ward 6 who their children go to charter schools. And I think people have rights to send their child where they would like to go. It's the formula. Every year we go through this. It's the same old, same old. I don't know what it's going to take for them to understand the seriousness involved here with this formula. So I am going to support this because of that paragraph. I agree with it. I agree what's happening with the funding in our city. It's getting to the point of how many more programs are we going to be losing in this school? How many? teachers no no salaries going up nothing's happening and i don't know what it's going to take maybe with our new senator coming in our new state rep who are really the type of people that look in the direction of what should be needed here now so let's see what happens but i will support this Thank you. Anyone else? Council Dwight. I, I, I suspect we're going to be revisiting this next year. I, but clearly the strategy here is to keep applying, hoping that the board changes. The uh, There's a new director of the board hoping that they uh, – it's, inter it's interesting that the strategy is to literally keep applying and hoping that the resistance will somehow become inured or numb to this and without actually – making the modifications that are the, that are required of them each time they're sent. I mean, unfortunately, charter schools were originally sold to us as a, a system that would promote innovation and creativity, and, and, and you were supposed to be on a business model that you could create a competitiveness that would, would, uh, would rise all boats in that tide. But it's... It, or level the playing field, as they continually say. But in fact, point in fact, it was canting the playing field considerably in one direction. And the fact is, is that this does not promote innovation. It actually hamstrings local schools as they lose more and more money. The programming, actually, as mentioned, that's another. Uh, I'm really glad that this was included. The some of the programs that we can, we could possibly realize. Without the loss of over, I mean, it's been $27 million over 10 years or since the inception of charter schools or, inter, or since charter schools were introduced in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. It is, it's cynical. It's darkly cynical. Um, the, and it does, unfortunately, as Councilor Nash and Councilor Murphy just pointed out, it creates this, this adversarial relationship among families, class issues, and all the other stuff. But it's what's also cynical is is, and I'm also glad that this is included is is the great disparity, um, <clears throat> particularly for special needs. Even even the students enrolled at Pioneer Valley uh, Chinese Charter uh, Chinese Immersion Charter School are not students with severe disabilities. There's no intellectual disability challenges for the most part. These are uh, in many cases kids with IEPs that diagnose them with dyslexia or other things like that that are actually relatively manageable. The city, the, the disproportionate amount representing that percentage that's here with Northampton, assuming the children with more severe disabilities are 
are attended to within our community because we're required to by law. For some reason, the charter schools get a buy on this. And as such, their communities are not as enriched as they claim they are, not even close. They're missing an enormous balancing contribution of a full spectrum of, of people of, of various cultures, needs, and requirements. And so uh, it is with anger each year that we vote for this. And we will be voting on this again next year. I guarantee it. And the year following that, the year following that, until something gives, either something gives in the state and how they, if uh, former Mayor Claire Higgins had said early on when this first started, said this is an interesting experiment. Subsidize your experiment. Pay for it. Don't require taxpayers uh, in local communities on their property taxes to subsidize this. If you want to do this and you think it's provable and it's workable, then the state should be required to fund it as opposed to putting the burden on individual property owners. So um, thank you to the authors. Again, I think you could just photocopy and just change some of the years on these and add one more amendment for uh, mentioning this resolution. And we'll do it all over again. And um, I'm peeved. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Anyone else? Any other comments? Um, the type, typo of the last paragraph, <coughs> first line, whereas the flawed funding program for reimbursement, re reimbursing school districts for their payment to charters, plural. We agree with that. Charter schools. Okay. Yes. Which are you talking about? Uh, the, uh, first, first page. Oh, first. First page, last paragraph, first line, last word. Uh, <laughs> yes. Charters, plural. Okay. So we've done that by a claim. Um, any other comments or adjustments? Okay. Uh, should we vote on this first reading? Sounds good. Okay. We have a motion, so I'll ask for a roll call. Okay. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Lavar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nass. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Goodwell. Yes. Okay. The resolution is approved in first reading. I'll just ask, is there any appetite to have a second reading tonight just to kind of move I, forward? I move to suspend rules. Okay. Is there, okay. Made in second. Any discussion on the suspension of rules? Uh, all those in favor of spending rules say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Move second, second reading. Made and seconded. Any discussion on second reading? Okay. Um, roll call on the resolution on second reading. Okay. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Okay, thank you. So that is approved in the second reading. Um, uh, now the consent agenda contains just a couple items. I'll read them at the request of any council or remove them for a separate vote. First are the minutes of October 18th, 2018. Next are the referral, the question of the referral of three appointments to the Committee on City Services. Uh, to the Conservation Committee is Randy Kratowski of 171 Emerson Way in Florence, the Housing Partnership, Alexander Jarrett of 8 High Street in Florence, the Human Rights Commission, Jeremy Whalen of 31 Union Street, Northampton. Are there any removals? Made, to approve. Made and seconded by Second. Councillor Dwight. Um, no discussion on this, so all those in favor, uh, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, one absence. Um, yep. Um, good, so that's approved. So now we will recess for the finance. Good. And welcome to finance. Laura, could you call our roll? Sure. Um, Councillor Murphy. Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Lavard. Present. Present. Excellent. So uh, first item is approval of the minutes of our previous meeting, which was October 18th. Uh, we get a motion to second. Second. Any, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Uh, the first thing is uh, our revisiting the tax classification. Uh, it's 18192, and uh, it's uh, there's really uh, nothing for me to read. We've already heard from uh, our finance director. We've heard from our principal assessor. Does anybody need any more information? I'm sure the mayor or the finance director would be happy to answer any questions for us. So are there any quick more questions coming out of the finance committee? Hearing none, then we have a motion to recommend a factor of one to the council. I can recommendation. Second. Second. Any other discussion? 
All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. That's the first order. Um, the second is 18193. It's an order to authorize supplemental appropriations from the Water Stabilization Fund for storage building at the wastewater treatment plant. Again, it's 18193. And uh, order that three hundred and thirty two thousand nine hundred and seventy two dollars be approved from the water or appropriated from the water stabilization fund to provide supplemental funding for the construction of a pre-manufactured wood frame building for equipment and vehicle storage at the wastewater treatment plant do we have a motion finance motion. Second. second and the mayor is here to answer any questions so councillors this is a um, this is a project that we've been working on for um, over several capital improvement programs and um, it's essentially to build a structure for storage of uh, for the water uh, department. Um, it would be a 36 by 72 foot um, building with uh, five sort of garage bay entry doors. Um, there'd be one heated bay in the garage um, for one of the uh, specialty vehicles that is often called out 24 hours a day. Um, and beyond that, it's 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 an unheated structure. Um, and it would be built at our water treatment plant. So we have gone through the design process. Um, we have gone through the permitting process in the neighboring community. Um, and the challenge has been when we've put it out to bid, um, uh, and we've put it out to bid three times, um, the amount of funds that we have appropriated for it under the capital program is not enough to, uh, to satisfy it. So as is sometimes, the, sometimes we estimate well and have leftover money other times where you know we estimate the cost of a project you know two or three years ago um, it ends up not being enough um, and so basically we have appropriated uh, or you have appropriated to us so far uh, 352,000 um, we actually are also um, allocating a little over $41,000 in an insurance settlement um, some of you may remember that um, our storage barn was part of the arson fire that occurred on Prospect Street, um, and that was actually a structure that we stored lots of water department um, materials and, and equipment. Um, so we're actually applying that little over 41000 to this project because it's going to replace that storage. Um, and that gives us a total of 394. Um, so we need this additional 332 uh, to be able to carry out the project. Um, the goal uh, was to try to get, the, we have a contractor who's given us a bid. He has, um, th they've agreed to hold the bid until tomorrow um, uh, because we do need this. We can't sign a contract unless we have all the funds appropriated. And the other big factor is we want to get in the ground and get this um, slab poured um, while it's still slab pouring weather. Uh, which is beginning to change rapidly. So that's the that's why there's a request for two readings on this. Again, this is a project that's been on the capital program. Um, you've appropriated funds to it. Um, there's funds sitting there. We just need additional funds to be able to make it uh, make it finally happen. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, oh, just a quick question. So, um, was this put out to bid as a prefab or pre-manufactured building, or is that? Um yeah, so it was, and um, the challenge is we still have to do design. We still have to, you know, we still have to hire a contractor to do it, um, and it was put out to bid and three separate occasions, um, and this is, uh, and in each time it exceeded the amount of funds that we had available. So at this point, um, we, I think we've done our due diligence that we're not going to be able to build the building for the, you know, under four hundred thousand that we thought. And so that's why we're coming to you for this additional money. Mm -hmm. uh, any other other quick councilor Klein? Um, I'm glad you mentioned the Prospect Street um, building and the fire there. I'm just wondering if it's it was looked into that that it would have been less expensive to renovate that building or kind of refurbish it in such a way that it could be a storage space instead of building a brand new structure. Um, if. You're talking about the shed that burned. The shed and anything else that's yeah. on that property. Yeah, the shed that burned was um, uh, was in rough shape to begin with. It was an old building, and it had these 
probably as best as shingles, the kind of like those shingles that look like roof shingles along the side. And it was pretty, pretty in pretty rough shape. Um, and the other piece of this is we have equipment already that's that essentially what we're trying to do is consolidate our operations at the water treatment plant and that's been going on slowly over the last couple of years and we have large pieces of other equipment that need to be stored indoors as well so this is really the direction we've been trying to move toward is having it all not having the all the equipment in separate locations um, we have the modern plant that's staffed um, continuously and we've got and that's where most of our water department staff report out of so that's why we want to have the storage of the equipment there um, long term we're actually looking to um, eventually dispose of that prospect street facility altogether that's the long term the building is doesn't meet ADA it's got lots of other issues and then we just lost our storage building so um, so that's sort of why we're not going to invest um, in a new uh, putting that storage space there, why we want to do it. Uh, I don't think that really affects the construction costs. Um, it's really just the costs, of, you know, the loca it's not really the location. There's nothing unique about the, about the <coughs> topography or anything like that. It's just the bidding environment. Another quick question. Um, was there any pushback from the neighborhood? I, you mentioned that um, the people were consulted in the neighborhood about the establishment of the building there? At the water treatment plant? Yeah. Um, if you've ever been to the water treatment plant, there's no neighbors around. It's, uh, it's by the... Um, it's it, not the wastewater plant. It's no, not no, no, no. This isn't the waste... I'm talking about the... This is, I'm talking this is about the one in the, Haydenville. Yeah. That one in Haydenville, which yeah, is the water treatment plant. Oh, it's in the middle of the woods, um, yeah. We did go through a formal zoning board process to get all the necessary permits. Um, and the... the um, our plan is not even visible from the street, and there's no structures or homes that are near it. Um, the n closest thing near it are the reservoirs that that and and we own most of the land, so it's it's that was not an issue. Yeah, but we did go we did have to go through the town process. Yeah. Uh, Councilor, go ahead. The, um, what is the amount of the pending bid that you have to respond to? Um, so the the actual bid. Uh, we're allocating 726.8, but the actual bid was. Cause we're, no, we have the contingency. Let me just see. Because we're also building in some contingency, right. which so we would normally do that. above and beyond the bid. Yeah. Yeah, so the bid is actually 632. Okay. Yeah. How much? 632,000. Um, but we typically build a 10 to 15% contingency okay. in just in case. Um, uh, we may not need it, but we always like to have that. And, and that was based on your your bidding cycles that you've gone through that it seems that we were pretty that it feels yeah we're we're not going to see it dip below 400,000 right. based on our experience so um, so we and we really want to get this equipment in out of the weather and uh, move forward with the project Councilor just, oh, yeah, how, mayor how many bays to this wooden frame um, it's it's a five bay building I can pass a picture around to show you what it looks like I mean, it's, it's a it's sort of a they call it a pole barn I'm not sure where that terminology comes from but it's pole structure. but it's a prefab building you know it's it's yeah have you looked into um, the metal buildings at all that is going to be that is going to yeah be? it's going to be very similar to what okay. uh, you know like the peas is built um, we actually toured uh, the director of DPW and myself uh, Tom Pease gave us a tour of the one that they built out behind 1812. So it's a very similar type structure. Um, metal siding, metal roof. Um, and again, it's largely unheated, except we'll have one heated bay um, because there's a, uh, is it the, um, yeah, what is it? Uh, I think it might be the camera vehicle. I'm not sure. The, one of the vehicles, they have to keep uh, temperature controlled. Um, if they have to go out in the middle of the night. And just to compare, so the, the 332 that we're asking for tonight is in addition to uh, already 300 that we've already authorized? That's correct. Okay. Plus we've got the 41,000 in um, insurance proceeds from the water department. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the mayor on the... Uh, Storage building. 
Uh, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of five. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the next is 18194. It's an order to suspend parking fees on certain days. Uh, order that on the following days, collection of fees for on street and off street parking spaces, excluding the EJ Gare parking garage, um, shall be suspended Friday, November 23rd, uh, 2018. Uh, generically known as Black Friday, Saturday, November 24th, 2018, which is the next day, Small Business Saturday, Monday, December 24th, which is Christmas Eve, and Monday, December 31st, which is New Year's Eve. Do we have a motion in finance? Make a motion. Second? Second. And the mayor's here. This is a traditional thing for us. This is a recurring um, order request that we make, um, and it sort of conforms with what we've done the last two or three years um, during these high visitorship and high shopping um, days of the year we, we uh, and many of our neighboring communities do the same thing so we're trying to be uh, uh, friendly to the merchants that way and to shoppers for convenience <coughs> uh, questions for the mayor on this one and hearing none all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance please say aye 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 any opposed and then under new business so I think the mayor has talked to us about this before this is 18173 um, and it's an ordinance to amend Chapter 312-36 of our Code of Ordinances. Um, upon the recommendation of the mayor, uh, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, again, providing the Chapter 312-36 of the Code of Ordinances be amended, uh, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton, uh, assembled as follows, the Chapter 312-36 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended. Um, and it shall read as follows, uh, amended, again, 31236E, um, class 5B, time limit unlimited fee for the, f this is in the garage now, for the first, the first hour is free, but it would be 75 cents rather than 50 cents for every hour after that. So hour two and on would be 75 cents, not 50 cents. And there would be a $20 fee for a lost ticket. And I think the mayor did mention it to us once, mentioned this to us uh, previously when he was talking about uh, on street parking. Do we have a motion in finance? Put it Make in the motion. Second? Second. Second. And the mayor can uh, talk to us about it again. So I've, I put together, I think, a pretty detailed memo that I included with this. Um, but the, the, the kind of the quick story. Um, and there's actually a graphic in the memo that maybe you want to scroll to that because I think that kind of really tells the story. But um, this we we have um, we've increased our uh, our hourly rate in our uh, primary surface lots that are close to Main Street uh, to 75 cents, um, and we've expanded those. We obviously moved Main Street to a dollar, um, and so the goal here is to to pr try to bring the parking garage. Um, I would note the fee has not been increased for 19 years because the last time that the parking garage was raised was 19 years ago. Um, and basically when you look at that chart, you see, and, and so now we've added credit card fees. Um, so the credit card fees uh, are, are, which again are great convenience. I think they've really helped improve the operation of the garage. It's something that you know, maintains the competitiveness of our system. Um, but those fees do take a significant amount um, of revenue. Uh, so when you look at something like a, you know, a two-hour parking uh, in the garage, um, you, you, you're paying 50 cents for two hours because the first hour is free. Uh, 25 cents of that goes to a credit card fee, so you're making 25 cents on a two-hour parking stay in the garage. And increasingly, it's now approaching almost half the transactions are using credit cards. And you can compare that to the Armory Street lot, et cetera. So really, what this 75 cent increase will effectively do is sort of make up for that lost 25 cents that we're, that we're behind. Um, and that's significant because we are making, we have made and will need to continue making significant um, investments in the garage. Over the last three fiscal years, almost $650,000 in infrastructure improvements. Um, and so the monies that we raise above and beyond the costs of running the system, you know, go into the receipts reserved fund, 
um, and we use them to then reinvest in the system. And that includes not only the garage, but it includes you know investing in kiosks and new technology. So that's the that's the recommendation, um, and uh, it would. Again, we estimate it would raise about $200,000 in revenue, um, in additional revenue, which again would go to the receipts reserved uh, for appropriations for future capital investment. Mm -hmm. Questions from the mayor on this one? I hear any? So I have, I can also add that I have spoken to the owners of Thorns Market, who obviously are the most directly affected by this, and they are, um, they are supportive of this change. There's no opposition to this change. Uh, Councilor Dwight. It's worth noting that the, the last time I was present at the last uh -huh. raise, and this room was filled with people who were very upset about the, mm -hmm. how we were going to destroy the downtown business economy with the raise. From 30 cents an hour. <laughs> exactly. 30 to 50. Uh, yes, it was 30 to 50, and, and uh, there was much gnashing of teeth and rending of hair and stuff. Yes, it was. and. And as such, we, as you point out, we, it is actually, uh, someone was just talking to me about it today, saying that I love the fact that <laughs> basically for 50 cents, I can park for two hours downtown. And uh, that just said, I, you know, it, and they pointed out that it seemed kind of absurd to use a credit card for that, but they would do that. Mm -hmm. and, and Well, the city eats the <coughs> fees, so there's not really any disincentive right. necessarily no 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 yeah. yeah yeah so anyway yes I mean I think uh, um, uh, certainly a reasonable time has passed and given the who knows I don't know once once word gets out about this this uh, pending increase maybe there will be some more yeah uh, and I would also just say that you know we did have that pretty comprehensive parking study and and yeah. you know the garage rates were something that they wanted us in the in the mid and long term to look at um, they even made the suggestion that at a certain point we may want to revisit the free first hour. Um, I'm not quite ready to step on that yeah, rail a, yet. But that's um, a, yeah, that's but, one but step that's, beyond. But th that is another, definitely just trying to make sure that our rates, you know, you've got Main Street that are now a dollar. You've got Armory, Masonic, Strong, other ones that are sort of the, just behind Main Street that are all 75 cents an hour. And here you've got a multi-million dollar covered structure, you know, with a, with a you know walkway to to the to Main Street and we're charging less. Um, well, the the uh, the reason for that was, of course, was to promote exactly greater usage of the parking garage. Yep. I mean, be people fighting for parking spaces on Main Street mm -hmm. when, in fact, they can go around and actually be as close, park mm -hmm. as close as they would if they were on Main Street. Yeah. But there was a psychological leap for folks. Yes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Councillor Scarry, you had a question. Um, actually, you just made the point I was going to make, which is that the parking study had recommended actually that we do away with the free hour and charge for that, um, and we're not doing that. And just to reiterate that the first hour will remain free. Yeah. So. And I've heard nothing but positive comments about the ability to use credit and debit cards in the system. That's gone over very, very well. And that convenience costs a little money, and the people seem willing to pay for it for the convenience of being able to use their cards. Yeah, oh, Councillor Klein. I just wanted to ask if there's um, any movement to kind of change the fee structure for the long-term parking there, the, what do you call them, kind of the people that work and rent out spaces? The, um, we are going to take a look at the leases. Uh, we didn't, we weren't looking at that in this particular iteration, but we will take a look at the leases. There's a, there's a monthly fee that we charge uh, for lease spots in the garage, um, so we will be taking a look at that as well but we wanted to just get this this one moving forward. But we will be taking a look at that and bringing that forward. Um, I will note that um, I did bring forward, actually, we did actually adjust the least rates in the last two or three or four years. Um, I was taken to task greatly for it. Um, but uh, we did and ended up being a much more minimal increase. But it, that, that has happened more recently than 19 years ago. I think that, well, um, Councillor Freeman, years. what's that? Four years. Councillor Freeman Daniels was here. I just remember that being part of. The, <laughs> so anyway, so that's but we we are looking at those, but we did just recently make an increase to those, in four years ago. Any other question for the mayor on this one? Uh, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. Aye. <coughs> Any opposed? 
And that's the end of our agenda, so a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Okay. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, back to full city council. We'll chew through some of these hopefully. The first is 18192 in order to establish a tax classification for fiscal year tw uh, 2019. Uh, is there a motion to approve this? Second. This simply says, ordered that the Northampton City Council approves for the fiscal for fiscal year 2019 a residential factor of one. Any further discussion? We had substantial discussion during the public hearing, but any now? Okay. So made and seconded, right? Okay. So roll call, please. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sheriff. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay, that is approved on first reading. Uh, we go now to 18193, in order to authorize supplemental appropriation from Water Stabilization Fund for a storage building at the water treatment plant. Second. Made and seconded. Any further discussion on this order? And have a roll call, please. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. 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 Motion on second reading? Uh, so moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on second reading? <clears throat> uh, roll call. Okay, Councillor Murphy, who's done? We're going to lose a vote on this yeah. one, I think. Councillor Nash? Yes. Um, Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shera? Yes. Um, Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. And Councillor Labarge? Yes. Okay, that is approved on second reading. Uh, now it's 18194 in order to spend parking fees on certain days. Motion to approve this. Second. Made and seconded by Councilor Dwight. Any discussion on this? Annual tradition. Um, if not, I'd ask for a roll call. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. And Councilor Murphy has not returned yet. Okay. So that is approved. Any interest in uh, two readings on this tonight? Is there ne necessity for two readings on I, 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 I would move to suspend rules given the fact you would? that you, we, this is almost rote. So. so I hear that as uh, so motion is made. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second. Oh, this could be contentious. Any discussion? I'm in favor of it. I see. <laughs> uh, all those in favor of spending the rules, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion on second reading? So moved. Second. Okay, good. Any discussion on second reading? Uh, so, roll call. Okay, Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Nash. Yes. We need a rule against mobile votes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. It adds a little bit of flair, <laughs> interest to what we're doing. And on that note, let's proceed to a bunch of second readings uh, for financial orders. 18176, in order to reprogram Academy of Music Capital Project Surplus to Stage Door Handicap Access Capital Project. To approve? Everyone does that one. Okay. Second it then. Uh, any, any discussion? Um, hearing no discussion, I'll ask for a roll call. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Uh, that's approved on second reading. Now, 18177, order to increase senior tax work off program maximum abatement. And I also say I'd ask for a motion on that jointly with 18178 in order to increase veterans tax work off programs abatement. No approval. So, Made and seconded as a group. Any discussion on these two items as a group on second reading? Roll call. Uh, Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. 
Both approved on second reading, now 18180, in order to authorize a payment in lieu of taxes agreement with Syncarfa Solar LLC. Second. second. Made and second. Any discussion on second reading? Roll call. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Bidwell. Yes. It's approved. 18181. In order to approve the purchase of 119 acres on Marble Brook leads. Uh, motion on this, please. So moved. Second right. from Councillor Bidwell. Any discussion on the order? Councillor Klein. I, I see that there was a request um, from the Bond Council to <coughs> amend something here. Wayne Fiden submitted an amended version with changes that have been recommended by the Bond Council and asked if I um, asked the council if it was agreeable to uh, making the recommended changes. And here they are. Red. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it cited a different Mass General Law in one place. And it added a paragraph, something to the effect that if there's a premium, it can be applied to the cost of the project and reducing the amount borrowed. So okay. So let's see. Red. Do we have the amendment in our? It, yes, it's, it's on the screen now, and it was included in the packet. I think it just came in. All right. Yesterday. So let's see. Um, mind if I play with your computer? Not at all. All right, so the amendments will be as followed. First, technical thing, strike out, ordered that, because we already have an ordered that. Uh, and then, <coughs> after the second paragraph under ordered that, the following language would be added. Further, that any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, less any uh, such premium applied to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of cost approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. Uh, in the following paragraph, um, what I'm going to do is read it as though it were in place, uh, replaced entirely with the following. Uh, further, that the proceeds of any grants, donations, or sales received by the city prior to the issuance of any bonds or notes pay the cost of purchasing said land and the borrowing authorized to be issued shall be reduced accordingly. All right, so I would appreciate if someone would make a motion to amend it thusly. I, I would move to amend, but also I'd like an explanation. Second. We'll, we'll certainly discuss it. So may and second it, Mr. Mayor. Sure, so um, this is actually, we are not planning on bonding for this. Again, this is one of these ones where we're applying for a grant, but we have no intention of bonding. But the Municipal Modernization Act changed the way that bond premiums are handled. And actually, you, we, had, we actually went back and amended some old ones that we had already done. Um, and so Wayne, when Wayne wrote this, I think he was using his same format that he was using for several years and didn't realize that the MGL had changed. So, um, so that's why we want to go back. Because even though we technically aren't going to bond, um, this vote would not be valid if we don't have the magic words that bond council wants us to have it in there. So it could invalidate the order itself because it's not in compliance and it, and it cited the wrong section of the law. Right, and in fact, actually, I would include that in the amendment. We did not uh, subsection seven strike three, and now it's one is to replace with the number one. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yes, I. So I didn't include that in the amended language, but so, it, but essentially, what is what it, what is this saying? I I have to say that my I I had a brain cramp when I was reading it, trying I'm to figure. Turn out this over to my <laughs> brain cramp <laughs> specialist, <laughs> Susan Wright. <laughs> Okay, so when when we sell bonds, there's a premium that comes with it. It's it's basically a payment back to right. us. Um, we end up paying for it, but it's it's all, I don't totally understand the whole premium thing, but we end up with this premium. Out of the premium, we pay the issuance costs. So we pay bond counsel, we pay our financial advisors. Then there's money left over. Like when we bonded for the police station, there was an eight hundred thousand dollar premium. What has happened in the last 
last year is the Municipal Modernization Act changed the way those premiums were treated. So you can, before the, when, before, once you had paid your bond counsel and your financial advisor, the rest of the premium went to the general fund. And it went into free cash. What the Municipal Modernization Act did is it changed how that premium is treated. So now, when we get a premium on a bond, the first thing we pay is the financial advisor and the bond council. The remaining premium is actually used to write down the amount of money that we borrow. So instead of borrowing for the paving last year, instead of borrowing $1.5 million for the paving, we technically borrowed $1.5 million, but then we got the premium and we basically prepaid part of our bond, our debt service. So we really only ended up borrowing 1.375 million. So it's, it's very odd and it requires the financial advisors to basically do everything, like they, they have to like figure out what the premium is and then they have to readjust all the debt schedules. But what it does is it saves us money because we're basically taking the premium and investing it and saying instead Against of principal. Right, right, right. Instead right. of holding on to this premium or putting it in the general fund, we're saying let's just borrow less money. So it writes down the cost of our, 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 our costs involved in borrowing. So, so for, like for the police station, when we did that years ago, there was a giant bond premium. Because the premium was on a debt excluded vote, we weren't able to just fold that into the general fund. We have to keep it in a fund over here. So every year when we set the tax rate, I have to take a certain amount that's based on a schedule and say, okay, the debt service that the taxpayers agreed through the debt exclusion to pay minus like $25,000, which is over here from this premium, and then that's how much we charge the taxpayers. So they wanted to do away with all of that having to account for it. And they also thought, you know, it's much better to use this money and borrow less than just use the money and, and, and then use it for other things. It goes right to its intended purpose. Correct. So you're really borrowing less money. So, so, okay. the, so that's why Wayne was using an old format, because this is a fairly recent change. So. Okay. Well. Um, my brain cramp seems to be easing up a little, so thank you. For that. It's it's it. it's it's hard to explain. No, believe me. Yeah, and well, they make it clear as mud here when they yeah. lay it out in language like this. So yeah, thank you. Good. Any other discussion on the amended language? Oh, actually, actually, we've not voted on the amendment yet, have we? No. Uh, so I'd like to do that unless there's any discussion on the amendment. All those in favor of the amended language, please say aye. 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 Oh, any abstentions? Okay. So back to the original order. Any further discussion on this one? Um, no, so we have a roll call, please. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. And Councillor Carnes? Yes. And that's proven in second reading as amended. Now, 18185, in order to reprogram radio hardware funds for radio hardware and radio consulting. Motion to approve this, please. So moved. Is there a second? second? Made and second. Any discussion on this? Um, roll call. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. And Councillor Dwight? Yes. It is approved on second reading. There are two ordinances which have not yet been referred. First is an ordinance relative to the parking on Grove Avenue. That's 18195. And 18196 is an ordinance relative to parking on Wilder <coughs> Place. Do I hear a motion to refer this to legislative matters? Move to refer oh, to a group. legislative matters. Second. second. Made by Councilor Klein, seconded by Councilor Murphy. Any discussion on the referral? Both of these have already been to transportation and parking, so they need not return. Um, Good, so uh, all those in favor of the referral, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed, any abstention, they are referred. Uh, now, one ordinance that is on second reading, we took action on it last time, 18125, an ordinance to amend chapter 312-104 of the code book. Um, that beautiful title means we are changing the rules in Florence, uh, parking in Florence on Chestnut Street and Main Street and Maple Street to uh, extend them to two hours. Okay, so motion on this? Yeah. Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. It's an ordinance. So I asked for a roll call. My mistake. Council on the barge. Yes. 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 
Murphy. Yes. Councilor Ash. Yes. Councilor Donald. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Uh, any opposed to adjournment? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much.